Well, hey, good evening and welcome. How the heck is everyone doing? I'm your humble, happy, hairy host, Bill Sylvie. It's good to see you. Welcome back to the Delver's Dungeon. Whether you are somebody who's been with us from the beginning of this, this nightly uh, show, this thing we do, or whether you're you're new here, you know, you came here because uh, the Dungeon Minister recommended us, or you just found us on YouTube, or you heard about us on Discord, or Reddit, or Facebook, or wherever. Welcome. I am happy to see you. It's good to see you here. Uh, and of course, when I say we, I don't have a mouse in my pocket. In fact, of course, I am talking about myself and my Antipodean awesome co-host, Mr. Kyle Shuan. Kyle... Oh. The Viking Hat Game Master. <laughs> good evening to you, my friend. How the heck are you? Good, good. Excellent, excellent. I'm, I'm here with my coffee and my and my copy of Traveler, so I'm good to go. Wonder Bar, that is great. And we're gonna, yeah. So that's that's the story tonight. We're gonna jump in and we're gonna see uh, we're gonna see some spaceship combat. We're gonna see the space elephant. Is basically what's gonna happen. <laughs> Is, is is that a, is that like a universal phrase? Seeing the elephant, Kyle. Um, I don't know. I think it's. I thought it was a more of a British kind of thing. I I never heard it when I was in, but um, hmm. But, I know, I actually heard about that. Uh, I read a book on the Civil War, yeah, and uh, the U.S. Civil War. I should specify um, how veterans who'd been in since you know Bull Run, a first Bull Run. And so on. The new recruits would come and say, "You know, you, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna crap your pants when you see the elephant boy." And you know that sort of thing. That was the first place I heard it, and I was like, "See the elephant? Is that like a veiled, <laughs> veiled reference to Republicans?" I don't, I don't know. Um, but then I, you know, I discovered the etymology of it. But anyway, so tonight, well, I, I don't know the etymology of it. I've just I've heard of it in like. It might, it might even be a, like a 19th century thing. So I, don't know. I have heard, the, the story I've heard is it actually refers to uh, younger Roman legionnaires who would talk to the veterans who fought Hannibal, you know, and he made uh. it across the Alps with a couple <laughs> of the like 50 war elephants he started with, but it was terrifying <laughs> to the Romans. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure it was, you know, you're going to, crap your little metallic short skirt when you see the elephant boy <laughs> um so yeah that that uh, that was how it was explained to me I, it's at least a 19th century thing as as you speculate so yeah. um so we, we're we're going we're going to see the space elephant tonight i'm not gonna crap my jeans though probably <laughs> that's like the 10 year anniversary of the show we'll have to watch out for that because i'll be old and then but um <laughs> But you know what's not old is the news, and here is a little bit of news. Folks, friends, countrymen, Kyle, we are at 935 subs on the channel, which puts us 65 subs away from the great online underground gaming convention, the Guac. That's right. It just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it, Kyle? <laughs> it shows <laughs> wise. It's like Ford, Hilton. <laughs> Microsoft, the great underground online gaming convention. Just, it's poetry. But anyway, so for those of you who are new here, who are just coming in and listening to the stream, watching the stream for the first time, um, I set a goal. It's been about 18 months back now. I set a goal and I said, you know what? If I get a thousand subs on this channel, I'll do something awesome. And then Later, I said, oh, okay, well, the awesome thing I'll do is I'll hold an online gaming convention. Ha, huh, that's what I'll do. It started out as a games day. If you go back and you, and you catch those videos, it's a games day. But I've upped the stakes. I've upped the stakes. It's a, it's a gaming con. An online gaming con. Don't come to my house. And certainly don't go to Kyle's house. Um, <laughs> well, that'd be I've funny. We've got more, sp more space in here, probably, so. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, I I look like I'm in the uh, control capsule for a missile silo here, and you've got actual room where you are. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so online event, I will be running lots of classic role playing games. Kyle's going to run some Traveler. He's going to run some Conflict. Paul Stormberg, and if you don't know who Paul Stormberg is, he's one of the nicer guys in our hobby. 
Uh, he's a frequent guest on the show. Uh, Paul is going to run some stuff. Uh, we'll have guests, I'm sure, but it's going to be fun. So tell your friends, tell your family, sign your dog up to YouTube if they like classic role-playing games. <laughs> and subscribe to the channel. Click the subscription button. Click the bell icon for notifications. And as you go through the older videos, if you like what you see, give it a thumbs up. If you don't like what you see, give it a thumbs down. It's all good because the more <laughs> I know about what you guys like and don't like, the better our videos get. So have we had any thumbs down? No, but I have had a couple, two or three negative comments uh, that weren't okay. just spam uh, in, in comments. But generally speaking, no, folks are... Uh, Folks seem downright enthusiastic about what we do here. So uh, that's that's a good thing. And I guess with fame, it'll come. You know, we'll have, you know, I'm sure there's there's folks out there. You're, just not, really, at the you're bill. not really in it until you got haters. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. We want, um, we want haters. Uh, I remember there was a, um, actually a barbell coach who said, uh, we, and we love haters. Haters are the best. Because they work really hard for you and giving you free publicity. Much, they work much harder than anyone who likes you does. Yes, they tell everyone how awful you are, which makes people curious. And I, I want to go and see this train wreck. They say, and so they go and <laughs> they go and have a look. <laughs> and some of them like you and stick around. So we yes. want haters. Bring it on. So um, to a degree, like you know, if you're a hater who makes it your life's mission to destroy other human beings please don't <laughs> yeah I, I don't want to stalk or anything you know yeah <laughs> yeah um but if but no, someone it's... abuses me on reddit yeah all good <laughs> yeah but yeah you you're you're a reddit mod god now you have the power <laughs> only on one subreddit <laughs> you're saying oh no dude let me tell you what any week now, you're going to start getting like little stipends from the PRC for your moderation of Reddit forums. <laughs> <laughs> Ten cents going to so. be paying you. I was uh, I was specifically brought into that particular one because they said, "Oh, it it, it, it leans quite left. We we want someone more center or, or right." And I'm like, "But I'm lefty." And you're, yeah, but you're you're further right than they are. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, yeah, it's all you, relative. So it, you bring it across. Um, and there's been a bit of clashes because. Um, they tend to uh, stomp down on uh, any. It's like, well, that that comment doesn't really have substance. They say, or uh, and it's like, well, wh well, why do I need to say it in thirty words when I can say it in six words? You know, and, and everything. Yeah. So uh, they tend to stomp down pretty hard, and I just restore all the comments and that, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and it's like let the conversation go where it may, because you know I'm used to um, uh, gym stuff professionally and game stuff. Uh, in uh, personally or in in my hobby life and at a game session it's never 100 percent focused on the game no, you know, even if not. you've got a convention game and you've got your two or three hours where you, you you've got to try to cram an adventure in, in that uh, short time without being able to say oh well we can finish it next week or whatever um, even that there's you know, there's going to be off-topic tangent talk, and it's the game master's job to try to bring it back on course. So there's some on course more often than not. But mm. in the end, if they want to show up to the game session and just sit around talking shit and eating snacks, they can. You know, that's <laughs> – and if it's only like 10 minutes of game that's and that's what they want, okay, great. You know, uh, similarly in the gym, you know, they – um they do lifts. The actual time under the bar, you know, they're here for like 90 minutes or something. The actual time under the bar is like 15 minutes tops because, you know, you get under the bar, you you unrack it, you sort of set yourself up, you go and then you do your five or whatever reps and then you rack the bar back up and then you change weight plates and the other person goes and you're sitting around resting and, and talking in between. So the actual um, productive, so to speak, time it's just a small fraction. It's maybe 15 to 20 minutes out of the whole uh, 90. But if you tried to cram that into 15 or 20 minutes, you'd wipe people out. Yeah. Uh, and also what tends to get people coming back is that it's social. It's fun. They get to talk to people and, and make new friends. You know, uh, we've had a, uh, a, a, I remember thinking one day it was a 21-year-old woman who was um, uh, of uh, Anglo descent, uh, 
and a primary school teacher chatting away to this 70 year old uh, Indian engineer, mm -hmm. retired engineer who's been working at Bosch. And it's like uh, Hindu or something, very, very different backgrounds who would normally not meet in everyday life. Um, and, and they were chatting away and, and becoming friends in that. And I feel what I like, I long liked about gaming is that it's the same. It brings people together of, of very different backgrounds. And we're all a little bit geeky, or at least a little bit. Um, but uh, it brings together a bit different background. And so if they chat and if it wanders, that's okay. So I, I feel the same way about, you know, uh, a moderating a discussion forum. Mm -hmm. It's going to wander. You know, in the end, we, you know, if it, if, if it wanders from, you know, the, the politics of a sales tax all the way to the Queen and the Prime Minister are li secretly lizard people, maybe it's time to bring it back. <laughs> but, you know, it's let it wander. So, um, uh, yeah, I don't think I'll be getting any checks from the PRC soon. <laughs> yeah. No. Um, and by the way, Diana found out that's why they had her killed. Uh, I'm sorry. Too soon. Is it is it too soon? Uh, but anyway, um, oh, sorry. When you said Diana, I thought of the lizard person, Diana. Oh yeah, from V. Oh, that's obscure. Maybe man. that's maybe V predicted that. Diana, the lizard person. We are through the Don't. looking glass here, people. <laughs> Hang on, Diana. I'm going to slip into Joe Rogan's DMs. I think we've got something here. <laughs> Because, you know, he does fitness stuff. Um, he could be a D&D &D geek, too. But anyway. Um, oh, I think I just screwed myself on the algorithm by saying his name. <laughs> but, uh, no, I mean, you're absolutely right. And I, I do take issue with something. Brother, I I went to college with lefties. I know lefties. I've even got some left. You are not a lefty. Don't don't tar yourself with that. It's so, all relative. It's, it, it is all relative. I mean, you know, an American lefty to most Europeans is like a corporatist centrist. <laughs> yeah. You know, or corporatist, even like middle rightist. So, uh, yeah, it is it is all relative. Uh, but we, we probably won't go on the political rant today. We no, that no, one, no. We should do that one day. We'll just have like, what's for Wednesday? Politics. Or no, we'll do it on my channel. So if yeah. if uh, if uh, it gets suspended or removed, it's not going to affect um, <laughs> it's not going to affect Dungeon Delver's uh, algorithms and stuff. Well, I so we'll I do it on mine because I've got nothing there. So <laughs> I thank you, I thank you. But <laughs> um, we'll just do like a political rant, and and people can see what insanity we have, and I could be banned from the internet. And <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> We're all uh, Lord Corian makes a very uh, salient point. We're all lefties compared to the Romans. <laughs> all right, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I think I should be able to speak out against the government if I want. No, you shouldn't. <laughs> <coughs> well, it's all anyway. about who. Uh, it's all about who you know. That was um, uh, Regia Anglorum, or I'm not sure how you say. It. Anyway, uh, it's a British. Um, or English uh, reenactment group, medieval reenactment group, mm -hmm. and they had a page about the cost of things, and amongst the cost of things were the fines, the fines that you got because you didn't get sent to prison. Prison was, you know, it, it's like um, I think you told me somebody was doing a tour of this uh, historical 17th century prison in Connecticut or something, and they and the tourist is like, why are the cells so small? And it's like, well, because they weren't there for years. They were just there for a week or two before execution. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so they, you know, they didn't have any. Uh, they had corporal punishment. They had the, you had your beatings and and severing things and setting fire to things, <laughs> all the rest, um, and execution. Uh, but apart from that, they had fines, and basically, it was less important what you did and more important who you did it to. Because, like, assaulting somebody's slave, you did get fined for. But mm -hmm. assaulting someone with you got a bigger fine for, and assaulting somebody's lord, <laughs> it was probably wasn't a, you'd be lucky if it's a fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, man, man, uh, I I'm so, I don't have two hundred Salidi uh, <laughs> for the Praetor. 
Oh, no, no, no. Okay, don't don't, don't worry about it. Listen, uh, we're going to pound your ankles and your knees to meal with a sledge then. <laughs> well, I don't want that to happen. Then give us 200 Saliti. I don't have it. Drag him over to the block. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so, I mean, that's why... Um... And that's why Traveller has got social status, um, because they've got the um, the uh, in the first three books. There's the implied setting of uh, mm -hmm. some sort of imperial uh, world, mm -hmm. um, and then the, there's arguments about how much that was by design and how much that was um, sort of uh, uh, how much how much is it feudal because that's cool, and how much is it feudal because like the game designers thought that that might make sense right so th this is where we this is the segue guide this is a segue into ships and worlds and stuff um, oh let's get back yeah. on the highway kyle there's there's the on-ramp <laughs> let's just thank you steered us right yeah. over there awesome um well it seemed natural so fi only 15 minutes here. um but yeah so there's an implied sort of uh a feudal system they, they don't go much on about it much in the first three books um and the thinking is because of the travel times because it's like a week-long jump between systems uh and then and that's and then but if you need multiple jumps it might be multiple weeks and months and then you've got to go to a planet to refuel and stuff so the the core worlds will be months out from the uh periphery from the frontier much as it was in uh, colonial times in earth so um yeah, so that kind of implies, on the one hand, a, a feudal society in the core, and on the other hand, a relatively lawless frontier society on the mm -hmm. on there, because they can't possibly police it all. You know, right. that's why that's why ideas of the liberty and so on uh, popped up in the frontier in in places like uh, North America and India uh, when they were still a little bit squashed down in the, in the core in uh, in the british in the heart of the british empire <clears throat> as i say um, it is citizens versus subjects citizens versus subjects yeah oh, all plain. so once again we've got uh these three little books mm -hmm. we had a look at characters in combat last time um and uh this time we'll have a look at starships so this might be time to add me. Whoa! What the heck? Oh, oh, we don't want. Oh, that. let me. We want my shared one. We want there your we shared one. Okay, there, there we, we go. go. The credits are lovely, but I don't think we need to have a separate screening of them in the middle of the show. <laughs> yeah. All right. So um, once again, we've got a little forty-eight page book. Oh, correction, forty-four page book. Um, these forty-four pages, they don't have to have a. Uh, um, a Wizards of the Coast disclaimer or anything like that. So this <laughs> chart, is, it goes all the way to charts at the back. If you are yeah. triggered by being sucked out of the ruptured hull of a spaceship, uh, don't buy this product. <laughs> um, there, I disclaimered for us. <laughs> well, I was thinking more, you know how like half the products out there at the moment have got that Wizards of the Coast disclaimer. Yeah. Because they're a copy of D twenty or D and D in it's uh, in some respects, right? Um, okay, so forty four page book, and uh, again the PDF copy that I have that I'm sharing with you guys is uh, a uh, a copy of the nineteen seventy seven version. There was another one in nineteen eighty one. Down here, you have the travel formula. This is the one that, this is the, the single formula in the book, which is what gave Traveller a reputation for having vector physics and stuff like that, which it doesn't. It simply doesn't. Um, that's just people who haven't done any maths at all. And again, we come back to uh, the expectations of, of people in the 70s versus uh, people today and so on. It, it was an expectation that you wouldn't have a problem with doing the square root. You'd use a calculator, but you'd know what a square root is. Uh, in any case, they've got typical travel times, so you can just use that. So anyway, let's get 
So th this volume of travel deals with the basic facts of interplanetary and interstellar travel and with the details of starships, their design, construction and operation, and with combat between spaceships. So they talk about interplanetary travel. So when you jump between stars, you don't just sit there on the uh, on the landing pad and then go jump and then land somewhere else. It's not like Stargate SG-1 where you just go through a gate or something. You actually physically travel in space. Um, so they've got uh, typical travel times and the, the assumption is that you accelerate for a bit, then you uh, turn the engines off, you turn around and you decelerate for a bit into your uh, target. Much like, for those who read it, Tintin, when Tintin goes to the moon, they have a nuclear rocket. Well, they take off with chemical rockets, but then they have a nuclear rocket and they accelerate all the way there. They stop, they turn around, and they decelerate all the way there. And that gives them artificial gravity because they accelerate it at 1G or at some fraction of, of gravity that lets them walk around on the thing without trouble. Nice. Um so they say, yeah, the typical travel time list indicates the time required to travel a specified distance, assuming one gravity of constant acceleration, turn around a midpoint and one G constant G deceleration. Specific distance travel times can be calculated by the referee or by characters using the formula there, where T is the time, D is the distance, and A is the acceleration. Um, so they're saying, look, here's a chart. If you really want to get finicky, here's a formula. But it's your option whether or not you want to get finicky. Right on. <clears throat> uh, so, again, we have an example of uh, these older games giving you options rather than just this is the way you've got to do it. So then they tell us that um, interstellar travel is uh, on the basis of jumps. Uh, we'll see later that it gets mapped up on a uh, hex paper with each hex being one parsec. It's mm -hmm. two-dimensional space, uh, and I remember the old traveler mailing list back in the 1990s. There were these length, lengthy arguments about three-dimensional space versus the two-dimensional uh, subsector maps, which would have the star systems laid out on them, and what it really meant, and was jump space different to real space, and blah, 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 and all these arguments. And in the end, it's like, why is a jump one week? A jump is one week because that's the usual time between game sessions. Yeah. You jump, the game master says, okay, guys, I need to prepare the next world that you're jumping to. We'll finish the session there. But Kyle, what does the dragon in the bottom level of the dungeon eat? Yeah, yeah. Um, and the two-dimensional maps are two-dimensional because that's a hell of a lot simpler. Yeah, exactly. Three-dimensional map, especially if you're gaming... You could possibly do it these days uh, with computers, um, like the uh, elite role-playing game. No, not elite role-playing, but the elite uh, dangerous computer game does and, and used to do in the early 90s, um, mm -hmm. even before great graphics and that. You could do it, but then you definitely need maths because you need to calculate the three-dimensional distance and you need like the Pythagorean theorem, but for, for with three um, numbers instead of uh, two. Um, but a 2D map is simpler. You can have pencil and paper. You don't need any computer programs. You don't need to be, remember in Wrath of, uh, in Khan, Wrath of Khan? Yeah. His tactical thinking does seem to be two-dimensional. It's harder to think three-dimensionally. It is. And I'll tell you, I, there was one space combat game, uh, uh, Fossa, the late great Fossa put out a game called Renegade Legion, which was the Roman Empire in space in like the the, the sixth uh, millennium or something like that. And the, the base game uh, was just called Renegade Legion. And the counters for the fighter ships that came in the box, rather than just being flat, <clears throat> they were little three-dimensional boxes. You would punch them out and then fold them up together. So, you know, you would be looking at the side of a ship when you're looking at the side of the box and so on. Which, But because they said, well, space is three-dimensional, you can have many ships in a hex and you would just stack the boxes one on top of the other. But the rule specifically said, if somebody knocks it over, everybody takes a, like a, a D10 damage. <laughs> to your ships 
if if somebody knocks it over. So there was a great incentive to make sure that somebody wasn't a butterfingers. But if this seems a lot more elegant to me, the the you know it looks it's just it's two dimensional because it's simple. Yeah, Coolish says uh, I I like looking at a three D map. I do not like using a three D map. <laughs> right on. Yeah. So that's why they use that's why they have two D maps. That's what it comes down to. Um, so they just call it jumps, and it's like, oh, but you know, this one's four point five light years, and it, how long's a jump? Well, a jump is uh, jump one is a parsec, which is three point two six light years, but then jump two. But what if it's five light years and blah blah blah? And it's like, no, fuck off. <laughs> We're just going to use <laughs> this flat map, okay? <laughs> I've seen lots of arguments about that, and there's even one. These insane arguments continue to this day on the Traveller Forum. Just this week, they were talking about, um, so there's a bit in one of these things where if you take a passage between worlds, um, this is the fee for passage between worlds. And they're arguing over, but what if a passage takes multiple jumps? Is it the fee per jump or the fee per passage? So what if something's two parsecs away? If you take a jump one ship, then you do need two jumps. If you take a jump two ship, you only need one jump. Do you have to pay more for two jumps than for one? <laughs> it's like, well, what do you do in the modern day? You know, I, I want to fly from Melbourne to London. Do I pay extra if I have to stop over at Dubai? And when they quote me the price, do they say, oh, it's this price to Dubai and then this price to London? I, I don't care about that. What's the total price? And how long is it going to take me to get there? And do I need visas and shit for Dubai? You know, that's what I care about. So it's, <laughs> but they were arguing back and forth for pages and getting warnings from moderators and all that. <laughs> and <laughs> this is what happens when people don't game, man. They start, they become bitter non gamers and start but screaming. They're non gamers, the dude. <laughs> so, um, anyway, so, uh, so individuals who decide to travel other worlds are confronted with the choice of the method and manner in which they wish to travel. Interplanetary travel is infrequent, but it's possible using ships, boats, cutters, pinnaces, or other vessels. Uh, because of the widely varying distances, a vessel must be chartered at a price set by the referee. So if you're just jumping between the main worlds and the system, between your Earth and your you know, Romulus Prime or whatever, <laughs> um, it costs a certain amount. But if you want to go from Earth to Jupiter, then it might cost some other different amount. Now, notice here something even many fans of Traveller don't get. They talk about individuals traveling. They're booking passage. They're not flying their own spaceship or starship. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you don't necessarily own a starship that you're flying around in, like in Firefly or Cowboy Bebop or something like that. Right. You do not necessarily own one. But you can still travel to the stars, even if you don't own it. You know, you, you don't have to own an aircraft to travel to, to, fly, to fly to London. <laughs> You don't have to own a, a yacht to uh, to go out sailing for the day. Um, yeah, so there's high passage that involves first class accommodations and cuisine. High passages have the services of a ship steward, entertainment, and complete attention to their comfort. A baggage allowance of up to one ton is included in the price of passage. Nice. Cost you ten grand. Well, also this high passage will be uh, not necessarily tourists. Uh, but if there are tourists, they're more kind of a safari kind of tourist that has right. a whole lot of junk. Um, but it'll be people moving to another planet permanently because when it, when the travel takes so long, you know, in the days when it took like three months to sail from London to Australia, there were a lot more people, a larger fraction of the people traveling to Australia were migrants. Not so many were tourists. <laughs> so... <clears throat> um, and then there's a middle passage um, where they get put into a high passage room, two to you know, it, um, two people in a room or whatever, uh, and mm -hmm. they don't have as much uh, good food and entertainment and all the rest, and they have a small baggage allowance. And then of course there's working passage. A starship captain with a crew shortage may hire an individual to fill the vacant position. Your guy Rico might look at that. <clears throat> Working passage may not continue for more than three jumps or the individual is considered to have been hired for a standard salary. So stingy captains <laughs> would just get working passengers and change them every three jumps. 
There you go. Or get them to sign a piece of paper that, or, you know, change their name every three jumps. <laughs> it's going to happen. I know you've mentioned in your games before that there are uh, sleeper ships. Uh, yes. What, what, well, uh, what... okay, that's that's a different thing. So there's sleeper ships. There's like colony ships. Mm -hmm. um, this isn't mentioned much in the. Uh, uh, it's certainly not mentioned in books one to three. It's been mentioned in some of the supplementary. Material. See, I see. Okay. But so it's sort of this the technology levels, and there's a certain technology level where you've got good maneuver drives and that you've got maybe fusion drives, so you can go to some significant fraction of the speed of light, like 5% or something, mm -hmm. but you don't have a jump drive. What do you do then? Well, that's when we get to the next kind of passage, low passage. Transportation while in cold sleep, suspended animation. This is what we get in Alien and in so many other movies. Uh, is possible at relatively low cost to the starship and thus to the passenger. The passenger is placed in a low passage berth before the ship takes off and travels the entire journey in a state of suspended animation. He does not age and requires very little life support. How long was I out, says Ripley? Uh, 57 years, says Burke. Um, yep. Unfortunately, the low passage system involves some intrinsic dangers to the passenger and he runs some risk of not surviving the voyage. Throw five plus for each passenger when he is revived after the ship has landed. Attending ex medic of expertise tool better gives you a plus one. A low end passenger with endurance of six or less one, um, is a minus one. Failure to achieve the throw results in death for the passenger. You know, <laughs> and it makes sense from, I, I'm, I'm going to go spherical cow on you for a second. Yeah. It makes sense from a gameplay standpoint, but that is a huge mortality rate. It is. It is. For, um, for, three, for four, cold five sleep passengers. Three, four, five. What's that? Uh, one, two, three. Um, so six out of 36. One in six death rate if they don't have a medic. And then it becomes a one in two. So uh, three out of 36. One in 12 death rate if they do have a medic. So, so yeah, you're, you're you're just you're doing like uh, yeah we're gonna 120 people are gonna go to this planet. You better have some redundant positions because ten of them ain't gonna make it. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's been mentioned elsewhere in the books that um, low passage. It was originally designed for livestock. <laughs> <coughs> livestock, not for uh, humans. <sighs> Uh, but then how some corporations function. Yeah, exactly. Now, you'll like this. It is customary for the captain to contribute 10 credits out of each low passage towards a lottery in which each low passenger randomly guesses the low pass number of low passengers who will survive the trip. <laughs> if the winner does not himself survive, the captain receives the money. The lottery <laughs> is administered by the ship steward. So when you're on that colony ship... <laughs> It's going to take two years <laughs> to go from the core to the frontier with a <laughs> lot of jumps because it might be significant because low passage, um, uh, low passage is just like a hundred. Yeah. Uh, oh, it only costs 1000 with a baggage allowance of 10 kilograms. <laughs> Basically they, they fit your baggage in the tube with you. <laughs> <laughs> so, Refund. you know, Refunds Some... and civil or criminal liability for low passengers sales to survive the trip are not allowed. It's very libertarian. <laughs> you you know, you could really grind that system <clears throat> if you were incredibly fit. <laughs> no. You know? No. Because you, you get a you get a minus if you've got low endurance, but you don't get a plus, a plus if you've got good insurance. Oh, 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 okay. So, All right. So don't put your grandma in cold sleep. You know? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> in low passage. Don't send your grandma. It's just the the young, more or less healthy ones need to go. Okay. Um, All right. So yeah, sleeper ships. Um, <clears throat> in some game universes, and I've used them in mine, where they have uh, decent drives, but they don't yet have jump drives. Well, they'll still want to colonize the stars, and I mean, it's been proposed nowadays like generation ships and stuff like that mm -hmm. are being proposed um it's just the engineering and the life support would be impossible uh, uh, with what we've got at the moment 
But um, the idea is being tossed out there. And yeah, they just stay in cold sleep the whole time and get revived at the end. Uh, which leads to the funny thing that, like, if it takes 400 years to get to its destination, and in the meantime, people invent jump drives, the people with jump drives could already have colonized the world when these guys show up. Yeah. <laughs> it would be as if, you know, the, um, the, um, the pilgrims set out to Plymouth. <laughs> and when they arrive, there's an airport there. Yeah. No <laughs> It's a bit rough for the guys, but that's what happens when we're dealing with uh, centuries. Okay. Uh, now, travel between the stars is also fraught with dangers, including those of hijacking, piracy, and mischief. So, um, yeah, hijacking. Starships can be easy prey for hijackers, especially because a starship can easily be used in distant parts of the universe without too many questions being asked. So, um, yeah, so they have a guard and there's anti-hijacking programs and things like that. So you just hit a button and they can't get into the console. Skipping. Most starships are purchased against a mortgage or loan and the monthly payments required against the multi-million credit debt are staggering. The owner or captain may decide to steal the ship himself instead of remaining under that loan. So, you know, how frequent would mortgage defaults be? If people could take their house and just sail it somewhere else. <laughs> well, we have those. They're called RVs, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, passengers that have no way of themselves of determining if a specific ship is in such a status. Uh, the referee should throw 12 exactly to determine that a commercial ship is of this type. In other words, one in 36 ships, they've skipped out on their loan. <laughs> If detected by the authority, they're subject to repo attempts. Um, piracy, of course, got to have pirates. Um, contaminated fuel. Contaminated fuel makes it more likely that you'll get a misjump. And a misjump, at the worst, could lead to the ship being destroyed, and at best could lead to it jumping a number of hexes in a random direction. <laughs> uh, lack of maintenance also makes uh, misjumps more likely. Um, and uh, yeah, so a mist jump, when you jump, you have to be at least 100 diameters from the world that you're jumping from. If you're closer, it increases the chance of a mist jump. There's, you know, we have some hand wave explanation about the gravity well or something like that. Sure. This, yeah. this yeah. leads to the interesting thing that if you're within 100 diameters of the star, that will also be in effect. So, uh, for example, in, in our solar system, Venus is within 100 diameters of the sun so you would have a negative there and definitely within the orbit of mercury earth you wouldn't because it's it's about a million kilometers across and it's 100 million um uh, kilometers well we are 150 million kilometers from the sun so we're good but not the uh but not the uh venus or mercury on the other hand you can think 100 diameters from uh, the earth What's the diameter of the Earth? 25,000. Uh, 25, 25, yeah. So, I was thinking yeah. of the circumference, but. Yeah. So, you know, like uh, seven, 8,000 miles, mm -hmm. seven or 800,000 miles is how far you have to go out. You know, that's, that's twice as far as the moon. So that's further yeah. than any human has gone here. Anyway, Starship purchase. In this, uh, Starships are absurdly expensive. So uh, standard terms are the payment of 101, 240th of the price each month for 480 months. So ineffectively, you're paying 120% of the final cost of the ship. Oh, sorry. In, yeah, and the total finance price is 220% of cash purchase price. The loan's paid off over a period of 40 years. So you'll probably sell it to somebody else with the debt still going. Uh, the government may subsidize large, larger craft. This, so this is why you hope to get a, a scout who picks up a, a scout ship or a mm -hmm. merchant who picks up, who got promoted a lot um, and uh, picks up a merchant ship. Otherwise, you're going to be hiring ships or stealing them. And stealing is quite possible as well. We saw that uh, in the Expanse TV series. They, the main characters started off on an ice hauler 
Mm -hmm. uh, and then they en ended after they that had been destroyed and they got picked up by uh, a Martian ship. And then that Martian ship got attacked. And while it was uh, obviously going to be destroyed, they escaped on a Martian frigate. And that was their ship for the rest of the time. They just changed the transponder codes and put up a new brass plaque <laughs> and said, yeah, it's ours. And normally it, it was pretty obvious that in normal times they wouldn't have got away with that. But because this war started and all this other drama went was going on, they just they weren't noticing the chaos. And they still were eventually discovered, but the, the authorities just turned a blind eye because, yeah, you're useful to us. So, right, <laughs> you know. Plus, uh, you know, we can't send somebody official to go and do this, but we can send you. That can be fun. I, I myself, and this is just preference. This is not a comment on the traveler rules at all. I'm just interjecting yep. that. Yep. I'm a big iconic ship guy. Like, I can't imagine Han Solo just being like, let's take that one. You know? Uh, I, oh, let, yeah, no. No. You go and you read the original Han Solo novels, which are some of the first ever Star Wars Expanded Universe books by um, uh, Brian Daly. And, I mean, honestly, it kind of borders on pathological. If Han could marry the Millennium Falcon, he would. Um, <laughs> there, there's, there's a bit where... Uh, uh, I, I don't want to spoil too much. They're, they're, they're good books, and there might be people out there that want to read them, but uh, there's an instance in one of the <laughs> books where the villains think something is hidden on the Millennium Falcon, so at an inopportune moment, they force their way into the ship when uh, Han and Chewie and some other uh, supporting players are, are, in a, are in a city, and they steal the ship. And... He's like, okay, I'm going to go get my ship back. And they're like, dude, it's like at an enemy's base, which is like, you know, 200 kilometers in that direction. And he turns and he just turns and starts walking. And he says, then we'll walk. <laughs> and, and one of the other supporting characters said, well, what if they've, you know, what if they stripped it? What if, what if they've taken it apart by the time you get there? And he turns storms back up to them and says, then I'll put it back together. <laughs> so well when they cost you you know 100 million credits or whatever <laughs> yeah it, exactly exactly and you put as much i'd, I'd walk 200 kilometers for 100 million bucks <laughs> yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you, you'd be looking at my ass the whole way by the way i just want to point that out <laughs> oh cool he says i'm really glad this cast exists so interesting uh, diverse topics thanks for saying that cool leash or however we say that name uh, we try to cover a diverse thing, but also talk about how it's the same principles. Yep. The same principles, different role-playing games, uh, different eras, different genres, and so on. Different players, but the same principles. At, at heart, it's the same thing. People snack um, setting system, and the dice are always right. Yep. And uh, Michael says, I'll take the scout ship. Always have a scout on your team. Yes, the problem is getting one to survive through some turns. Yes. <laughs> when you're rolling up. Um, yeah, so, okay, ships are really expensive. However, there, there are two uh, branches that you can join where you may get a ship. There's always the possible possibility of stealing one, of course, um, or uh, otherwise coming into possession one in the course of an adventure. And, um, you, of course, you can have many ad adventures without a ship the the early seasons of uh, stargate sg1 they still went between worlds and had adventures mm -hmm. they were essentially a scout team without a ship right it's just they did the they just didn't have any travel time they just walked to a gate and that was it but you know if you just added some moment uh, some moments where they're, they're traveling on ships in between uh it wouldn't fundamentally change what they're doing you could still some you just hand wave yeah you book passage to the ship or you know a, a scout ship takes the scout pilot stays in the ship you take a shuttle down and then you start exploring uh, and you wouldn't fundamentally change it you could essentially have stargate sg1 as an adventure uh, setting for traveler 
it wouldn't uh, change what you're doing. So you don't necessarily need a, a ship at all. But, you know, if you're really keen on one, you can always steal or hijack one and so on because there's no alignment system in this. There's there's no alignment. There's just consequences. <laughs> so right. the people that you steal it from may not be happy about it. Um, but if there's enough chaos going on, they may not notice. So, um, All right, so they talk about operating expenses. Fuel, fuel is usually not much. Um, the problem is usually availability of fuel. Uh, you need they have liquefied hydrogen in this. Exactly whether it's used as reaction mass, you know, like a, a reactor heats it up and chucks it out the back, or whether it, it's fed directly into the um, some sort of reactor and burned up in some way and the exhaust out the back. They don't specify. It's kept vague. Um, it also, the fuel is also required for a jump. Um, fuel is relatively cheap, like 500 per ton refined or 100 per ton unrefined. You want refined, unrefined is like there's methane mixed in and stuff like that, and you're more likely to have missed jumps. Uh, and your, your ship requires more maintenance and stuff. Uh, life support's a bit more expensive, 2,000 per trip made, per person, 2,000 credits per person per trip made. Uh, they must be eating some good food. Hmm. Um, and then there's routine maintenance. You've got to give it two weeks off a year to um, to be pulled apart and put back together. It, that wouldn't be a full breakdown, obviously. That would be replacing this dodgy steam hose or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but, I mean, that's, that's up to you as Game Master and players what sort of thing you imagine. Uh, again, as, as I said in the last one, with Traveller, whether it's something like Star Trek or something like Expanse or Aliens uh, or something like Star Wars or something like Stargate SG-1 is entirely up to you. My personal preference is for your, your Aliens, Expanse kind of thing, where it's kind of blue-collar guys in space. Because my reasoning is like, I, I like um, with the technology to be as close to realistic as possible. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I'm, I'm willing to grant a couple of things. I like the old school sci-fi where they just sort of change one thing. It's like, okay, if this, there was this one invention, what would happen? Like if we had intelligent machines, what would happen? If we had um, uh, people could live forever, they, could, they wouldn't age. They could still die of accidents, but they wouldn't age. What would be the consequences of that? I like that kind of thing. So if we just sort of take modern technology more or less, and add a jump drive, then we get something like the Expanse or something like, um, well, they had the jump drive and the Epstein drive. Uh, so they also travel fast, be, relatively fast between planets. In a I don't want to, I don't want to get too cynical, but I think if you, d it, if it was the jump drive, um, or let's even just say near FTL, um, I, I, I tend to think it'd be like Outlander Alien. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think like if it because when there's just a few people going into space, it, they they're going to put a lot of resources into them. It's going to be high tech, and they're going to take care of everyone really well. Very glamorous, very heroic. <laughs> yeah. Um, when there are millions of people going into space, it's going to get nasty and greasy. Yeah. You know, it's going to be like your guys at an Alaskan oil rig and stuff. It's going to be like that. Just so. Um, that, that, that's my thinking. Um, so, yeah. And so all you, you add is the drives, the two drives, and you end up with something like Aliens or Expanse. And you can have some pretty interesting sci-fi in there. Whereas you get into Star Trek and you, or Star Wars and you're adding a lot more technologies and um, you get into the Asimov thing that sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Right. So it seems quite magical, and you sort of like how much is it sci-fi and fancy? That's that's my personal taste. So everyone varies. The point is, this stuff it's up to you. It's up to you as game master or player which you want. Um, so yeah, so when, when I think overhaul, I'm thinking changing hoses and things like that, and I'm thinking you can steal a starship, but people will come up after you if they possibly can. Um, birthing costs, landing and handling fees is expensive. Then there's revenue, um, cargo and passengers. Cargo, you're, you're doing um, what they call free trading. So uh, 
in the modern world, most cargo is predetermined contracts. You know, you, you buy this much oil or buy this many containers of fluffy toys or whatever, and then you <laughs> sell them in the, in, in they're sold in the destination country. And they're not sold by the guy who ships them. He's just paid to ship them. Um, what still exists in some parts of South America um, and Asia and Africa, and what used to be much more prevalent is the free trader, who the, the guy who would just... He'd own the ship and he'd buy a bunch of cargo on spec and he would hope to sell it in his destination or somewhere along the way. Um, and the free trader, of course, it was there was much bigger possible rewards, but um, much bigger possible failures as well. It's like the difference between having a nice salaried job where the salary maybe isn't great, but it's secure, and being self-employed where the possible rewards are great, but you might be a dismal failure. You know, so there have been so, and that's what the spec, the, the cargo stuff, and there's a lot of there's a lot of dice rolling and stuff, and uh, there's dice rolling about it to determine the price at the uh, pickup and at the destination, um, and it's much as you might expect. So if you get a green garden agricultural world, and the other one is a place like Mars, they will pay, pay well for food and liquor. They mm -hmm. probably won't pay very well for iron oxide because they're like, yeah, we, we've got, that's like the entire planet. Yeah. We've yeah. got that. <laughs> we don't need that. <laughs> yeah. um, and vice versa. So, you know, on a on an earth which has been producing lots of food but which is churned through most of its um, easily accessible resources, they will probably welcome getting big shipments of, uh, you know, platinum and iron and that sort of stuff. Um, but they don't need. You know, if there's any food, it's going to be like, oh yes, the uh, you know the 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 Arcturian wine. Okay, it'll be mm -hmm. just, but that's a you're not going to buy thirty tons of that. Uh, that'll be a small stuff. So yeah, it's speculation. And um, going back to the traveling mailing list and traveler forum and that, there's been much discussion over the years when where people calculated all the probabilities and said, you know, on average they're going to make a slight loss if they do that. And I said. And my response to that is, number one, it's a role-playing game. It's not a trading simulation game. You know, you're not playing yeah. Monopoly here. Yeah. Um, number two, hey, maybe that was by, by design. Maybe Mark Miller wanted to keep the players on edge. So they're always just about to make a profit and then they don't. What do you do when you're on edge? You start taking bigger risks. Such as, for example, I got a, adventuring. <laughs> I got, I got, a, I got a story for that. I got, a, I got a perfect story for that. And and um, there, there have been a few attempts at making traveler computer games, but one of the accidental best ones, and it's still a going thing today, is Elite. Um, and Elite yeah. was a space trading uh, sim. I found a nice, easy route between two very close planets in elite that I could run necessary goods back and forth between them. I still had to buy fuel, still had to buy the occasional missile, but would, would, um, I, I'd come out on top and I, my 13 or 14 year old self, I thought this is going to be awesome because I'm just going to grind I'm not a social <laughs> butterfly. I got nothing. Me and my Commodore 64 on a Saturday, nothing to do but <laughs> grind short jumps to lave and back. Um, lave being the name of the planet uh, with these, these necessary supplies. And I was so happy. I had, I had a nice little nest egg and I'm thinking about, Oh, I just need like 15,000 or 1,500, whatever more credits, and I can buy a hydrogen scoop. And I can do a quick <laughs> pass through the, the, the outer, you know, the not burning to death layer of a star to scoop fuel. And then my profits are really good. I got jumped by two pirates on the <laughs> outer edge of the system and shot to shit. And I, I, may, I survived. I made it to the station. But all my money, all my money went into getting my ship basically operational again. Yeah. And when I looked at the trading board, I noticed Lave needs narcotics. 
<laughs> Lave needs illegal narcotics. <laughs> and it was just like that's what all, all, the, all the money I could want for taking some smack <laughs> to Lave. <laughs> and I did I I said, all right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I gotta do it. I got, I, I got it. I cannot spend another God. I, it, it was like, you know, eleven o'clock on a Saturday night. I'd started that morning. I can't. I can't. I can't do. I can't do this fifteen-hour grind again. So I did it. I got jumped by the cops <laughs> <laughs> on my way out of the system, and of course the police ships. I, I mean, in my like held together with Kapton tape and uh, space blankets <laughs> spaceship that I had, you know, two, two police cruisers were like, I mean, it wasn't even heave to, it was just like, nope, we're opening fire on you, dude. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what happens. Yeah. So that's my reasoning. Like if you keep them on the edge, then that makes them start thinking, maybe I should smuggle those narcotics. Yep. Maybe I should may, maybe I should pick up this dumb kid and this old man from this stupid desert planet yep. that want to evade the, like they want to evade the Imperials them who the hell are these guys what yeah. you know what are they it won't be any problem it'll be an easy job <laughs> this is really gonna save our neck these two must be super desperate it'll get me out of trouble with Jabba everything's gonna yeah. be fine <laughs> yeah oh that's the other thing I was gonna say about how to win a ship gambling because that's on the personal skill development uh table that's one of the personal skills that you can get nice one of the, the skills that you can get gambling so if you have a high level of gambling you could just like okay the, the players can be okay do i have a friend with a starship all right i challenge him to a game <laughs> <laughs> and you know because um uh when you're rolling for your starting cash so the mustering out minutes, it's for cash. You get a bonus to that roll if you've got gambling skill. Because <laughs> you over the time you took that cash and you built a, a larger nest egg from it. <laughs> nice. So, so you start take your starting cash with a hundred thousand and you keep betting, and eventually you you might get your mate's starship. Of course, you might end with nothing. But you can do that. True. Um so talked about getting jumped by the cops in elite let's uh you know do what it says on the tin kyle what happens <laughs> when we're bopping around and we got our uh... well you well you probably die <laughs> okay oh oh okay, okay so for those of you who read the descriptions ooh, they're gonna they're gonna play out some traveler combat not with my character we're not <laughs> <laughs> um so okay so we'll all right starship construction um so basically there are standard designs uh, and they take time to build so ideally you want a used starship <laughs> because a used starship will be ready today and it will be cheaper so... <laughs> yeah but it smells like a locker room <laughs> <laughs> well they're all going to after oh, six months true. and you won't notice because you will too <laughs> so <laughs> you will smell like the very dirty gym socks you just jettisoned <laughs> um okay so they just got whole sizes going 100 ton amounts uh, a side note a ton in traveler is not a, a, a real ton it's what they call a displacement ton um and mm -hmm. it's equivalent to one ton of liquid hydrogen which is 14 cubic meters ah, just to confuse I see, I see. Us. yeah you know just, so, just, just in case 200 copper to 10 silver but 20 <laughs> silver take a gold and an electrum yeah. and then a platinum just in case you you came to traveler from original dnd and you weren't <laughs> confused enough <laughs> yeah so um yeah so when they say for example that the uh, the low passage the, the the tube takes up one ton it's actually 14 cubic meters and you can sort of think well okay two meters by two meters by two meters so two meters long for a person and two meters high because you're probably not going to stack stuff on top of it and then two meters wide because you need a bit of space around it to be able to maintain it and, and check on the guy and all that well that's eight cubic meters and there's probably another six cubic meters of support 
you know, refrigeration or something <laughs> for the guy. <laughs> so that sort of, that seems roughly all right. Um, that, that, uh, and it might even be half a cubic meter, I can't, uh, half a displacement ton, I can't remember. But yeah, so when they say 100 tons, 100 ton ship, that's actually 1,400 cubic meters. And anyone can do a, a Google search uh, and find, people have done comparisons of the basic traveler ships with um, real world, like Boeing 747s or something like that. And they're pretty damn big. You know, your, your scout mm -hmm. ships like the size of a Boeing and stuff. Wow. They're pretty, they're pretty big. They're, they're fairly spacious. They're not like real world spaceships. And that's basically because they've got these fantastic drives. They, where the taking off and landing from a planet doesn't require 90% of your mass to be thrown away. So <laughs> um, maybe just 50%. So yeah. Um, now the way they do drives and power plants is uh, they've got type A through Z power plants, maneuver drives, and jump drives. Um, and a type A maneuver drive requires a type A power plant and so on. So like a, a type N maneuver drive yeah. would require a type N power plant. If you don't have it, you can't power it. Likewise, the, the jump drives. Um, and each of them have a certain mass. So like a type A, uh, it, it fills up four tons. So if you've got a type A in a um, 100 ton hull, type A, well, so that's power plant, maneuver drive and jump drive, that would be four plus five, 15. That will take up 15 tons of your 100 ton hull on a 100 ton ship. Right on. With a type A, it would give you, um, yeah, it would give you jump two and two Gs. Okay. It would give you two Gs, 14. And then you, you go through and you add in fuel and so on. But if you had the type A in a 200 ton shell, it would only give you one G of acceleration um, and one a jump one. The that makes one sense. RC rather than two. So, so did yeah, they... that, that's why they've got this um, this chart laid out like that. And well, yeah, if you put a type A in a 400 ton hull, you're not going anywhere. <laughs> it's just not powerful enough. You know, your engines go, but... You have station have keeping it. jets. Congratulations. Yeah, you have got a lawnmower engine in yeah. inside, your, inside your city car. <laughs> so... Um... Now I know, like when uh, when we were looking the other night, we because we were looking. And by the way, uh, if if all this sounds very interesting and intriguing to you, you can get Traveler still this version of Traveler, just like you can get OD and you can get the print uh, print PDFs of of uh, classic Traveler. Um, but I noticed when we were looking at that last time, Kyle, I something caught my eye, and it was like a catalog of ships, a monster manual for ships, if you will. Does <laughs> d d does Classic Traveler there, the, the black box set, do we get an exemplar ship that we can motor around in yeah, without having a, to do the math? Yeah, yeah. There's a couple of um, examples. Okay. So, yeah, there's engineering section. Bridge computers. This is where. So when it says price, by the way, that's the price in mega credits, millions of credits. So it's a lot of money. But of course, game master can change the price. Um, the, and this is where you get the large computers that everyone complains about uh, and mocks. Um, One ton, I, sixteen kilobytes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I firmly. Um, well, they don't say how many kilobytes they are. They don't say all that. They just say CPU level or whatever. Um, I pretty firmly defend them because I know that modern naval, uh, like uh, military naval ships, their computers are quite large. Mm -hmm. And the computer will also contain many backups and uh, refrigeration systems and stuff because keeping a steady temperature is important to these things. And that's going to be a lot harder if you're flying around between the stars um, mm -hmm. and, and there's vacuum outside. So, and, and it will also include the station and like the, the guy's chair and his monitor and all that sort of stuff. So I don't really have a, a, pos a problem with that. Um, because science. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes. The lo low passage is one half ton. So seven cubic meters, okay. which makes sense. All right. We've got lasers and all the rest. Um, required crew, pilot, navigator, engineer, steward, medic, and gunner. Um, 
like one gunner is required for each turret mounted on the Starship. Um, you need more engineers if the ship's bigger and so on. Okay. They start with non-Starships. Lifeboat. Displaces 20 tons as 1G acceleration carry up to three conscious passengers. In addition, it contains five emergency low berths. Ripley, you get in there with your cat. <laughs> um, each capable of holding four persons in cold sleep. So you could put the whole ship on it. Uh, oh, all occupants of the same berth share the same survival role upon revival. Throw six plus to survive with normal DMs as applicable. Because they got in there in a hurry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there goes the engineering section. Whoops. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so ship's boat, acceleration of up to six Gs, cargo capacity of 12 tonnes. That's for zipping between uh, like live starships and uh, space stations and stuff. Pinnace, cutter, shuttle. Um, shuttle is meant to go to and from planetary surfaces. Um, they don't use much fuel. 10 kilograms for each a G of acceleration for 10 minutes. Expendables, there's missiles. Sand's a funny one. You chuck sand out that's meant to disperse lasers, um, which apparently is some, there's, there's some similar uh, thing that people are looking at lately to, um, you know, if they send their missiles and they're worried about lasers shooting them down, maybe they could send some dust ahead of the missiles and all this. And Interesting. Whatever. Yeah, apparently that's an idea being tossed out there. Um, anyway, okay, standard Starship designs. Scout Courier. Using the Type 100 hull, the Scout Courier is equipped with four staterooms, uh, which may accommodate double occupancy and non-passenger service, suitable for the crew of one pilot and additional crew members or passengers as the situation dictates. Takes No low berths are installed, so there's no freezing you. So it has 2G acceleration and can do to jump to. Uh, the hold contains an air raft and a specially fitted a compartment and three tons of cargo hold space uh, with one double turret. So this is your basic adventurer's exploration um, uh, craft, and uh, that costs $32.5 million. Then there's a Type A free trader, which is the one that you uh, will see on all the online advertising with the, you know, the triangle sort of shape. Yep. Using that is, the... um, there is a, I think I mentioned this last time, a company made a 28 millimeter, well, you can size it to whatever you want with your printer software, but you can now get a model of the classic Traveler Free Trader, which I think is pretty cool to 3D print yourself. If you have the patience in a 3D printer. <laughs> <laughs> Free Trader, yeah. So this isn't a super powered ship, but like the Scout has got drive power plant um, and jump drive A, but but that only gives it one G and jump one um, because it's a larger ship, uh, mm -hmm. but it's got a lot more cargo space and it has two hard points. They don't have turrets, but uh, they do have space for um, to stick a, a turret. Now, Michael Connor asks a question and I'm not sure of the context here. What about Traveler New Era? Uh, Michael, is that like in the overall, like what do we think about it? reference oh, that, to ships and technologies that was come, um, come back to us with that or yeah, unless kyle was, you want to take a stab at it uh yeah that was just one of the many versions of traveler okay so some multi, some extra editions of traveler like you know uh third versus fourth or fourth versus fifth or whatever were changing the rules ah. some of the editions were changing the background so um as we discussed before, there was this background of, you know, they tried to, GDW tried to put all their games in, in one long timeline of of having your um, world war in Twilight 2000, and then the surviving countries rise up again, and then they go to the stars. So there's the French arm and so on. So we've got Traveller 2300, also known as Mega Traveller. Um, and then over some unspecified period of time, uh, it becomes this grand imperium, because uh, the other story was that when uh, Earthers go to the stars, they meet other humans. So the Solomani, as they call themselves, being from Sol, uh, mm -hmm. meet the Vilani and the Jodani. And the, the story goes that uh, this other race of aliens came and picked up humans and seeded them across the stars. Ah, uh, your old Eric von Daniken. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I gotcha. 
three yeah, didn't cross the stars. And um, I can't remember. I think some in in some instance they uh, actually gave humans the walk, uh, the the jump drive. So it's a little bit like that uh, Star Trek movie where you know the the guy creates the warp drive. There's been a world war, and the guy creates a warp drive, and the Vulcans happen to be passing, and they see the warp drive signature, so they come and say hello. Right on. So it, it's either that or it was the reverse. They saw humans had got to the planet, so then they came and gave them a jump drive. I, I can't honestly can't remember. Um, and uh, so then there's the Valani that have this society. Uh, I can't remember the details of, but the, the Jordani who were sort of a stand-in for the Soviets when you read them, but they had Sinoks. They had a large number of them were telepathic and the telepaths had taken over society. So um, they really do have thought crime because they know <laughs> if you're even, it's not enough just to do the right things. You have to think the right things. <laughs> they no know. fake in it. There's <laughs> yeah. no, oh yeah, yeah, we love Big Brother. Absolute. You don't. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you're thinking. Yeah. <laughs> So there was that, and um, then there was, in the storyline, there was this attempt to sort of, oh, look, the Imperium, it's too structured. There's not enough room for adventure, so we'll have the Imperium collapse. Uh, there's the virus and wipes out all the computers and that, so the Imperium collapses and then comes back up again, and, and in the meantime, the frontier is lawless, so you can have adventures there. Um, and then there was New Year, and I, I, I can't remember all the details. As I said... A traveler is the town bike of game systems. It's been, <laughs> you know, there's there's five different versions of traveler just in the main traveler line, and then there's traveler hero and D twenty traveler and GURPS traveler. Um, Didn't Fossa take a stab at it, or am I? I I don't know, mate. I don't. Know. It's, <laughs> I can't. There's just there's just too many. This is another reason to go back to the original because it doesn't have all that, and then yeah. you can just make it what you want. Yeah. So yeah, there's the free trader. So the scout courier and the free trader are the most likely ones that um, the players are going to be using on a day to day basis in a normal sort of adventure. There are larger ones, the subsidized merchants, um, and then um, yachts. Uh, there was um there was a game where um, the players they um, they rented a yacht. Because they were they were stuck in this system, mm -hmm. they couldn't get they didn't have a ship and they couldn't get out of the system. But they had some spare cash, and they when they got passage into the system, they uh, had stopped along the way. The the uh, ship owner had stopped along the way to drop off some stuff to some miners. He was dropping off food and liquor to these miners in the asteroid belt. And um, when the when the players got to the, the station and spent some time drinking and going to brothels and stuff, they said, actually, because, and they met Harry Mudd <laughs> <laughs> and, and he was running a brothel and they proposed to him that they could take a yacht and then take that out to the asteroids and to the miners. And they're like, couldn't we give them a high class call girl service, you know, brothel, you know, <laughs> so we, we bring the we bring the prostitutes out to them, and we bring them with a bar with heavily marked up drinks, and that's where we really make the money, <laughs> charging like twenty bucks for a beer. <laughs> um, so it really yeah, is that first episode of Star Trek where we meet Harry Mudd. Yeah, <laughs> when it, when he's when he's pimping the women out to the dilithium miners. Exactly. <laughs> so we did that, and I might have given him a different name, but I I used the picture of Harry Mudd. <laughs> I use that picture. Um, nice. <laughs> and uh, if you Harry guys Mudd seen is it, one of my favorite to, Star Trek characters of all. If you time. guys haven't seen that, you have to go back and watch uh, the, the original Star Trek and yes. see the episode with Harry Mudd. Classic Star Trek, Harry Mudd, and that includes the animated Star Trek. By the way, I consider that part of classic Star Trek canon. So um, there's the, you have three Harry Mudd episodes. See them all. So they they rented a yacht and they went out there. Um, and uh, the business was very successful. It was so successful, in fact, that the miners didn't want them to leave. <laughs> and, they tried to, <laughs> and they tried to hijack the yacht and take the women. So they had to fight them off. And so when they brought the yacht back to the um, when they brought the yacht back to the ship uh, to the um, space station, 
the owner found out and was very alarmed and upset because <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's like like turning into a brothel he could sort of tolerate you know even though like he was some high level guy i can't remember he was a like it wasn't an admiral but he was a commodore or a noble or something i can't remember anyway he could sort of tolerate that as long as it was on the quiet but it was now full of bullet holes <laughs> and there was blood on the in the airlock because they'd spaced these <laughs> they said uh, after some pirates and surrendered they spaced them <laughs> There's a uh, there's a very travel <laughs> travelerish book. It's it's from the the 1960s, I think. Uh, but it's called The Witches of Caras. Um, yeah. The economy and the politics, I think, uh, uh, are right up your alley, Kyle. And anyone who wants a good sci-fi yarn in the traveler vein, you should check it out. It's The Witches of Caras. Um, the hero starts out. And the first mistake he makes is he tries to do a very good and noble thing. <laughs> by buying these three teenage girls who are all being kept as slaves on a planet. So he's like, okay, well, I'll get you out of servitude. I'll, I'll, you know, and he boosts back to orbit and is flying along and here comes a police ship and they make him heave too. And they're like, you're guilty of slave trafficking. Wait, what? No, I I rescued them. That's that's why I. Oh, I'm in trouble, aren't it? Yes, yes, you are. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, the, a yacht's been used once, and then you get into the cruises and that, and cruises and, and larger ships. And it's custom design ships. So, if the players really want a custom design ship, they can. But they would still have twelve months to kill while it's being built. Twelve to twenty-four months um starship combat is um pretty brutal uh, minimum uh, a, a playing surface represented a two-dimensional surface at the scale of um one to 63 something that's three zeros six zeros one to 63.36 million or in more familiar terms one inch equals 1000 miles <laughs> Um, so yeah, none of this one inch equals 10 foot in the dungeon or 10 yards outdoors It's one inch equals 1000 miles. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so look, you're doing true to movement, true to laser fire and then ordnance launch and they shoot missiles and they try to shoot the missiles down. If you watch the expanse TV series, it looks very much like that, except they don't really show lasers in that. Um, and you have this sort of thing where you've got to slot your programs in and out of your computer mm -hmm. um, if you don't have a sufficiently uh, big computer. Uh, yeah, so they draw vectors, but it's not really relevant, not really relevant to the players. It depends. Vectors are most useful if you've got like a grid, but if you've got a hex, then you don't need it. Because the right. vectors, like you know, because the diagonal is longer than the the straight sides on a grid, so then you have to start having to you know know your Pythagorean theorems and stuff like that. Um, we honestly don't usually use space combat very much because the consequences are so you know it's a it's a campaign ending thing. Man to man combat you can lose half the party and then the rest just roll up new characters. Right. But um, if you lose the whole ship, then uh, you've got to roll up a whole new party. It's a new campaign. Uh, you know, I think GDW realized that because it, when they created Twilight 2000, because tank combat can very much be the same thing. Yeah. You know, a, a 125 millimeter heat round, flies into your uh into your m2 bradley and it's good night irene but they're like um roll a 1d6 on a one through three everybody makes it out okay on a four through six everybody takes like like 1d6 times 1d6 wounds to every location of their body and makes it out okay yeah <laughs> they they really they, they they stepped up their survival uh of the player characters game just a bit so there. That, so they do give you some chance. Um, 
so the, the damage definition. So the drives, they just get attrited by one level. So we, you know, we talked about levels of drives and things like A, B, C, D, etc. So an E level drive gets one damage and becomes a D level drive. A D level drive becomes a C and so on. So you, remember you got that 200 ton, uh, 100 ton ship and A drive gives you 2G. Um, if it, and uh, um, but a B drive would give you 3G. So mm -hmm. if it's got a B drive, it gets attrited down. So you've gone from having three manoeuvre to having two or having three jumps to having two, uh, being able to jump two par six or having mm -hmm. a three level three power plant to having a level two and so on. Um, so what it means is like if you've got a 200 ton ship with um, well, some, yeah, you may actually end up not being able to move at all. You're disabled. So technically, you still have a drive. You've got an A-level drive, you know, but it's gone all the way down from F, and so your 500-ton ship just can't move. The drive's not powerful enough to, to move you at all now. Each turret hit incapacitates its turret. Uh, hull hit decompresses the shell's hull's interior. Mm -hmm. So this is why in Expanse you see them get up in their suits uh, before a, a combat starts. Uh, damage to the hold, you can start losing bits of your cargo. Um, each fuel hit punctures the fuel tank and releases about 20 tons of, of fuel. Computer, it operates like the drives and stuff. It whittles down the level. Um, so, yeah, special situations. Decompression. I think you can figure that out. Um, well, give me a table to roll on here. What, <laughs> I've got shot, Kyle. What 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 am I rolling? What happens? <laughs> Decompression. Well, it just says um, um, yeah. You don't need shot because it just says uh, explosive. De yeah, uh -huh. hull hits result in explosive decompression if pressure has not already been. Um, lowered explosive decompression kills all persons in that section unless a vac suit is available and put on immediately throw nine plus right. to put on available vac suit dm plus the level of vac suit expertise and DM i've got two levels of vac suit i might make it out of this dm plus the dexterity of the individual yeah so you need to roll seven plus seven plus here we go okay okay exactly uh well no i rolled an eight i rolled an eight it's yeah. my lucky so, day. Yeah. So I'm not breathing time. vacuum. There's a scene like that in The Expanse where, um, I, I, where I think it's uh, Bobby, the uh, Martian Marine. She, oh no, sorry, not Bobby. I'm not thinking of that. I'm thinking of Alien, where she slips into her vac suit, really quietly. Um, I think with her cat, uh, without alerting the alien. Jones, that's, she had that's vac suit skill. She had put Jones in the uh, in the pod, but not okay. uh, not not like uh, started the hibernation sequence or anything. Okay. But yeah, that that was Ripley basically having like six levels of vac suit. No, it's only it's only a couple, only a couple. But that's fair plenty. enough. Fair yeah. Um, abandoned ship should circumstances warrant a ship may be abandoned due to ship's vehicles or other um, other methods. Atmospheric braking, ships passing very close to the surface of the world with a standard or dense atmosphere may slow their speed. If any portion of the ship's vector passes within a quarter inch of the world surface, that vector is reduced by a quarter inch in length. So it just slows you down. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, I like this. Individuals in vac suits who are not picked up may attempt to land on a planet. So if you're in a vac suit, you're drifting away from your ship, you just wait to be picked up. But yeah, a vac suit can support its occupant for about a for up to 110 minute turns. So a thousand minutes, so several hours. Uh, an additional air recycling tank, a tank will provide another hundred turns. A vac suit is capable of a total of uh, three inches of acceleration. So you know you've got your little ch -ch -ch, your little jet thing. I like this. A foamed atmospheric reentry abate ablation shield, part of the vac suit kit can protect the individual while entering atmosphere. How would you nice. like that, eh? Just a foam thing to, you know, you, you, you're going um, uh, Starship Troopers style. Yeah. <laughs> Start in the book, because in the book, they jumped in their suits. <laughs> Not in their spacecraft, but in their suits. 
Yeah, they 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 had the uh, the capital the capsules that would ablate. Yeah. Uh, you know, one one at a time, and then their final like mile or two down was them yeah, and the power armor. Yeah, they popped off and popped off and they came down. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting you mentioned that NASA actually in the early 1980s, and I had a big book of space stuff when I was a kid, so I know this is true, but NASA <laughs> in the 80s looked at emergency reentry systems, um, you know, like, like, oh, shit, we got to bail out of the shuttle. These were not comp, these were not Star Wars escape pod, you know, or Star Trek, like Star Trek escape pods can make like warp 1.5. And keep you alive for years just you mm -hmm. know it's in a space about half the size of my recording studio but um and even a, a star wars escape pod you could sit down in but no this is they, these were literally like conical shields weighted one on one end and you got like five minutes of attitude adjustment to get pointed down and start going towards the earth but mm -hmm. that that was it so that's that's pretty cool yeah and now I think in order to do that, you would need gigantic balls or uh, ovaries to <laughs> to yeah. get in one. And I, for one, would be terrified out of my mind. But, you know, I'm not a space traveler. So, um, yeah, and then there's uh, damage control, ship's locker, which has survival gear and so on. Uh, yeah, now there is a random starship encounter. Woohoo! When a ship enters a star system, there is a chance that any one more variety of ships will be encountered. Um, what do we roll for? Dice, that? Throw two dice, apply a DM based on the star port of the, the system. Uh, that's not described till the next book. Um, so the star port, there's a star port type A is like your full on, full service thing where they can, you know, build an entire ship for you. And your uh, type X is like, there's nothing at all. And type E is just a marked piece of bedrock. <laughs> this is where you land and maybe like a warehouse with a windsock kind of thing. Um, nice. And uh, yeah, so if you roll, normally if you roll at, um, nine plus, you encounter a starship. But uh, if it's a better, it's a, a place with a better uh, star port in the area, you're more likely to encounter a starship ah, I see, so I see. yeah and if you if you uh, throw 12 or modify 12 you encounter a pirate <laughs> so roll the dice and so all right let's see. let's see here let's see here what do, what do we got okay I, I got a nine on the nose nine on the nose um so you would encounter a free trader it just well there's no uh zero level one so it depends on what the system was so if you're in a regular system uh, with like a really good shipyard, type A shipyard, that would be a number 15. So you'd get a subsidized merchant. Um, if you were in a system which had um, no starport or just a marked piece of bedrock, that would become seven or less. So you wouldn't encounter a ship at all. Notice that also means like if it's a, a, a ship, a, a system with no uh, starport, because you've got minus two, minus four, and because you need 12 to get a pirate, you're not going to get pirates in systems where there's no starports. They're like, there's nothing to steal here. <laughs> so what's the point? Well, I mean, I, mm, I, okay. I don't know. I, I mean, obviously I would want to sit down with the rules and just unpack this, but I mean, I could see like some desperate pirates hanging out, you know, just waiting for somebody, anybody to jump. <laughs> in 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 a situation like that it's like you know we are down on our luck here we're you know we're wanted men we have the death sentence in 12 systems um <laughs> you're gonna hang out at the place with a shack in the well, wind they're gonna be waiting a long time because like remember the pirates aren't really going to be looking so much for the free trader types the pirates are going to be looking for the regular commercial shipping you know so like when when those somali pirates board ships they're not boarding that little like 200 ton skiff that takes around some hay bales <laughs> along coastal Kenya or something. Fair, not, fair enough. You make a value. They're not boring. Yeah. They're not bothering with him. They're, they're, they're doing the big ass container ship yeah. that's uh, with cargo worth 
38 times as much as the ship itself. <laughs> so, you know, they're harassing them. So, I mean, but of course, uh, any gay master could just change the, uh, change the chart if they like. Oh, drugs. Drugs. I'm not sure why this is in the Starship's book, but I guess they had to put it somewhere. Um, <laughs> <laughs> slow drug is named because it makes the universe from the viewpoint of the user to move, appear to move more slowly. Accelerates the metabolism. Um, when taken, slow drug takes effect after three firing rounds and continue function for 40 firing rounds. At the end of the effect, the user receives 1D in wounds or hits. Uh, those of you who have watched or read the Expanse uh, series, there's a character, Julie Mao. She has special enhancements where she can just basically do this. She just sort of goes, and then she freaks out and she acts super fast and super strong and just murders people. And then about 30 <laughs> seconds later, she falls over uh, and she's throwing up and seizing up on the ground and stuff. <laughs> um, Good Lord. Yeah, it's pretty hardcore. Um, <laughs> there, there's a bit where she does it. She's uh, <laughs> like she's uh, in a spacesuit, and so after she's spazzed out in the after she's done her thing in a spacesuit, she then throws up inside her helmet. Oh. So, <laughs> oh, is she in uh, zero G? Well, look, the expanse started as a role playing game. Ty Frank was the game master. I was watching this a, a great podcast for those who like the series. Um, not so popular and deserves to be more popular is uh, there's a, a podcast uh, stream, Ty and That Guy. So it's Ty Frank, uh, one of the two authors, and uh, Wes Chatham, who plays Amos Burton. And he's called That Guy because there's a bit where uh, there's this other guy who's his friend who is going to get revenge on a guy who'd hurt his daughter, and the, the friend's about to, to shoot this evil mad scientist and um and amos says to him no nah, don't and he sort of puts her weapon down it's like don't you are not that guy and, and his friends like oh yeah yeah you're right you know he doesn't want to be a murderer kind of thing even if the motherfucker deserves it he doesn't want to do it and so, so you know his friend turns and walks her away and the guys to amos like oh thank you man thank you and amos says i am that guy <laughs> <laughs> And blows him away. <laughs> so nice. Um, so it's Ty and that guy, and it's where Jason talking, who is nothing like his character Amos. He's, a, he's obviously a really lovely, genuine, uh, enthusiastic, friendly guy. Um, so uh, yeah, expense started as Ty. Well, he was doing the world building, and friends said, you know, flesh it out a bit more uh, by putting it in a role playing game. And as far as I can tell, he used Traveler. He doesn't. He's never said which system he used. But it looks very much like a used traveler. Yeah, you can definitely you can definitely pick up on things. Uh, it's it's nice to see gamer stuff permeate. In um, I was not a huge fan, for example, speaking of space combat, of uh, uh, the uh, Star Trek Enterprise, the one with uh, you know it was supposed to be like the first Enterprise that mm. that uh, preceded all the others. Um, but they did a weapons test and, uh, you know, the phasers were brand new technology and, and they were they were trying them out. And they found it. Wow. When we do this, they really they're really incredibly powerful. And the weapons officer said, well, essentially, we overloaded the phasers when we overlook. And he said it like a few times in the discussion and it finally clicked with me. Overloaded phasers, the only other place that occurs in Star Trek lore is in Starfleet Battles, the the uh, Texas Amarillo design um, tabletop game. So it's very clear that the writers had some, or Amarillo Design Bureau, rather, they, they had some some knowledge of ADB and just kind of slipped yeah. that in there. You well, know, I've so. no doubt, I've no doubt there's a bit of parallel evolution that goes on in a lot of sci-fi and fantasy where people just think of the same things because it's a sure. reasonable conclusion or reasonable next step from whatever was there. Um, but there's a lot of deliberate um, uh, imitation as well. Uh, so like in the first episode of Ty and that guy, uh, Ty Frank, talks about how he deliberately, 
you know, like he loved Alien. They, they talked a lot about Alien in the movie. And he mm -hmm. said, you know, I think that's what it would be like. It would be blue collar. And I like that. You know, they talked about Amos is going along and he's got his toolbox and all his tools have got his name scrawled on them and on them in a childish scrawl. And, um, you know, someone says, oh, can I borrow your pry bar? And of course, he's got a pry bar. He's on a spaceship, but of course, he's got a damn pry bar. Of course, bar. he's got a good pry bar. And he hands over the pry bar and he says, you are going to give it back, right? Because you know, that's important for him. It's his tools. And uh, Wes Chatham was saying how uh, he worked for a bit uh, at um, he worked for a bit uh, at an air hangar where they were, you know, repairing aircraft. And it sounds like they were smaller aircraft sessions and things like that. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, that's how the guys were with their tools. I can These are my it. tools. This is my tools. You know, and and this is it, it's the blue collar pride in your work kind of thing. This is where this tool goes, and this is where I keep it. Yep. You know, this is where I keep it, and that's where it's damn well. If it's not there, I've got words for you. you know, I said um, it's like um, uh, Walt Kowalski in uh, Gran Torino in Clint Eastwood movie. Gran Torino. He's got all these tools in his shed accumulated after years of of, uh, of doing work. You know, and each has got its place, and he looks after them. And if you can borrow it, but you damn well better bring it back in as good a condition as we lent it out to you. Yep. <laughs> My um, old man, whose name so, happened to be Walt, was the same way about his tools. He did construction almost up until he passed away. And if he was on a job site, if you needed a drill, if you needed, a, if you needed a level, if you needed a hammer, <clears throat> a mud knife, anything, you could absolutely ask my dad and you absolutely, before you walked off that site, needed to put it right back in his hand. Yeah, yeah. This is very and much so, the same way. Uh, they're saying they liked Alien because it had that aesthetic um, and because they did a lot of show rather than telling of, you know, the, the, the one guy following around the other guy and obviously junior to him and learning from him about, and, you know, and they're obviously going around tightening screws and, and bolts and, and, you know, fixing leaks and all that sort of stuff. And it wasn't all this glamorous stuff that you see in Star Trek or Star Wars or whatever. It was, it was grungy stuff, you know, um, and so they, they, yeah, they deliberately imitated a lot of that uh, aesthetic and style. Um, so, I, I yeah, tell you what, the other drugs. I was, I was just going to yeah. say, just real quick, for free, I I would eat up an Outland TV show with a friggin' spoon. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I would. would. It would be fantastic. Anyway, drugs, drugs. Drugs, yeah. So um, there's a slow drug makes things move more, move more slowly. Um, a medical slow drug is also available being used to hasten recovery from wounds or illness. Causes your unconsciousness and passage in a 30 days equivalent in time to one day. During this time, ordinary healing takes place. So it just knocks you out. So you can... uh, and then there's combat drug. Increases strength and endurance by two. And then after you, it lasts for 30 rounds and after that, you get one day and win. So fast drug plus combat drug. I think uh, is probably what Julie Mal had. <laughs> so um, yeah, sorry, slow drug. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And she had the in combination, so she increased her strength and endurance, and um, and uh, like a haste spell basically. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then after that, falls over. Uh, um, medical drugs. That that's just a general term. Uh, Anagathics slow down aging, which is not. An, an issue for um, player characters because they're not going to die of old age. Um, truth drug, you can guess. Um, synergy, if more than one drug is taken, the combination may have an adverse effect called synergy. It's like the potion missability table. I was just thinking of that. <laughs> potion missability, baby, come on. Yeah. 10D6 so, explosion um, inside. <laughs> legality, worlds may have legal restrictions regarding the possession and use of drugs. Well, I mean, we've got a combat drug now. It's, it's you know, we've got a number of combat drugs. Uh, yep. You know, uh, testosterone and uh, Anavar and uh, human growth hormone and so on. Mm -hmm. And um, most Western countries restrict the use of those, even though they're not instant and, and giving you rage or whatever. Um, the closest that instant that gives you rage is uh, methamphetamines. That's pretty heavily regulated in most of the Western world. But you go out somewhere like Peru or whatever, you can go to a pharmacy and get... Um, and get human growth hormone. I don't think you can get methamphetamine, but I haven't asked. I never asked when I was on my honeymoon there. 
I didn't ask for the testosterone either. But the <laughs> dude, the the Air Force issues long range bomber crews go pills. Yeah, you know, it's like yeah, half the crew can sleep on their way from Kansas City to Afghanistan, but when it's time to you know when it's time to do the thing, take one of these, you know. Yeah, perk you right up now. Experience. Some people have complained there's no way for characters to improve. Um, you know, they come from a thing of D&D where you're leveling up. But the mm -hmm. thing is your characters start fairly competent. They're really, they're in a retirement career. Right. So most of them won't have done just a single term and just have one or two skills. You can, as I said, be 18 years old, have no skills at all and go for it. Um, but most will have done a term or two of something. Um, and most will have done three or four terms. Some of the merchants will have done uh, six or seven. But yeah, um, so yeah, as characters travel through the universe, they already know their basic physical mental parameters, their basic education and physical development have already occurred and further improvement can happen only by dedicated endeavor. Um, the experience which is gained as the individual character travels and adventures is in a very real sense, an increased ability to play the role which he has assumed so you get better at being an engineer better at being uh, a fighter or whatever a warrior you get better at doing that because you're more experienced with the game rules you know more about the game the game universe so you get better at doing that and that it, it's not as tangible as you know having a plus one on the on your 2d6 roll um, but it is actually an advantage which i think a lot of people don't realize it it was it's really clear to me when I play, um, I've mentioned before playing uh, the online computer game Insurgency Sandstorm uh, with multiplayer and you get players with more or less experience mm -hmm. and just like uh, one guy who's a military veteran, he joked, is it like military experience is actually a hindrance to this game, not a help <laughs> <laughs> because you expect things to work a certain way like in reality and of course they don't, they work in right. a certain way like they do in the game. Um, so, uh, yeah, you've got more experience with how the game works, so you get better at handling it, even though nothing tangible changed in you. So that, I think that's not to be underestimated. Nonetheless, you can change the numbers on your character sheet. Um, okay. So you can only do one of each of it in one time, education, weapon, expertise, other skills, and physical fitness. In each field, the character devotes himself to a four-year program of self-improvement, dedicating his endeavors in something like obsession to the general end of self-improvement. Because persons do not always have the will to continue with such a program, I see that a lot here in the gym, <laughs> there is a chance that the program will be planned but never actually carried out. After the general field has been chosen, the character must make a dedication throw, throw eight plus. No DMs apply except when throwing to enter a physical fitness program in which case, plus two if intelligence is eight or less. It helps to be dumb <laughs> in the gym. And it, he, Mark Miller is fucking right. <laughs> the, dumb, <laughs> the dumb ones do better in the gym because they don't question it. The smart ones overthink it and think, oh, yeah, but Kyle, but like, no, nah, just get, just do it. Yeah, but no, just get under the bar and do it. And the dumb ones are like, oh, yeah, okay. The smart ones also get scared when the weights get heavy, but the mm -hmm. dumb ones don't because they don't understand that it might be dangerous. So, so you, when you're doing a physical fitness program, you get plus two if the intelligence is eight or less, plus four intelligence is five or less. Mark Miller is absolutely right, but it might just have been a game balance thing. It's like, okay, he's a bit dumb, but let's at least make him tough. Um, a failure to achieve the story indicates that the self-improvement program is not carried out and a new one may not be attempted for at least one year. You know, you tried. You went to the gym for a few months. No, you can't go off and start uni now. <laughs> yeah, but no. 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 <laughs> you, you spend another three months telling yourself that you're going to go back to the gym. <laughs> you don't do it yet. So education. A character with an education characteristic lower than um, their intelligence may improve their intelligence level through the use of correspondence courses and tutoring. Uh, you do a session a week. Um, after 50 sessions, about one year, the character's education level is increased by one. So in, in this four-year period, you can increase it to a maximum of uh, six levels. So if you've got um, like education 
four and intelligence ten, you can bring it up to equal. Okay. Time. As long as you keep making those dedication throws of eight plus, you 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 just you improve your general education. If, however, your um, education is ten and your intelligence is six, you can't improve your education anymore. That teaching that you got at school and that that's as much as you're able to grasp. They were able to push you to go a bit beyond your natural intelligence because the education is more your general knowledge and stuff. They were able to push you a bit, but you can't do it by yourself. <laughs> so, yeah, the, the, the person who's intelligent but not educated, they can improve. The person who is not that smart but is well-educated well can't. Um, education increases gained are permanent. Um, in addition, a character, any character may, once in their life, take a sabbatical for four years for the purposes of specifically gaining a skill for education. Such activity is the equivalent of a technical school or college education and allows the acquisition of one specific skill with a level two. Now, remember, again, the skill here is sometimes referred to as an expertise. It's not a skill uh, like GURPS with 400 plus skills or uh, even like RuneQuest with, or was it 100 or something? It's a skill like a profession. Level would, would, one. Would you compare it to like a background skill in AD&D? &D? Possibly, yeah. Possibly, yeah. So level, like level one medic is a paramedic. Level two medic is a nurse and level three is a doctor. So if you've got even level one, you can do that as a job. Okay. All right. So it's a little two, more in depth. A little more in depth. Yeah. I level gotcha. two is a fairly well paid job with, with some respect adding to it. So you spend four years and you come out with a job qualification. That's level two. Um, so, yeah, when you think of the skills, you've got to put, put them in that kind of uh, perspective. Okay. <clears throat> so doing that in four years is not bad. But you still got to throw eight plus. <laughs> Maybe you bail on it in those four years. Yeah. Plenty of people do. I looked up the stats, something like one third of people bail on their um, tertiary education on, on their university course. Yeah. Uh, weapon expertise. The skill in which a character has in his weaponry indicates his native trained ability by dedicating himself through training and practice to specific weapons, the character may hone his skill on a temporary basis. Consider that highly skilled marksmen achieve their best work when at the peak of their training. One, it's not that thing where you get really good and then you retire for 20 years and they call you back and you're still a crack shot. No, no, despite, you know, what they show in, Commando in, in that documentary Commando with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, <laughs> the famous retired, documentary. Yeah, retired guys just like they get fat and weak. Um, so one gun and one blade weapon may be chosen. Skill level in each is increased by one for the duration of the program. Um, <clears throat> if the skill is chosen, which character is skill level of a half, <clears throat> so that zero level skill that you have in everything, um, because uh, characters have player characters have skill level zero in all weapons, uh, and non player characters, if they don't have military background, it's minus five. Uh, so if you choose one where you've got skill level zero, skill level is increased for that weapon to one on a permanent basis. At the end of this program, skill increases are lost unless the program is extended or continually continued formally for another four years. After a second four year program, the improved skill level becomes permanent. So that's how it's different when you when you're doing um, when you take a sabbatical, you just get the skill at the end of it. When you're uh, for a, a general professional skill, for a weapon skill, you get the skill improvement straight away. As soon as you've done a week of training, you get the improvement. You're down on the range, you're practicing, and and you're better. The question is, is the the improvement permanent? And that's when you do your throw after your four years. Um, but you do a second four years, and it becomes permanent. Uh, permanent. Uh, and then there's um, other skills, improvement, uh, fashion similar to that of weapon expertise. A character may temporarily improve the skill in another field by dedicating themselves to it for a program of four years duration. Only two skills may be chosen, and they must have a skill level of at least one in each skill. So that's improving.
current skills. Okay. It's funny that this is in the the starship section, but there just wasn't enough room in the um, okay. in the characters and combat section. Can only get it. Can only get so much printed so, at the print shop, man. <laughs> well, it was paid, it was forty four pages. So, right. Right. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Alternatives. Uh, that's only the ordinary method. Highly scientific or esoteric methods of improving personal skills and characteristics are logically available. Provide the individual search hard enough for them. Such methods could include RNA intelligence or inter education implants. Oh, Johnny Mnemonic. Hit me, four gig. Um, <laughs> um, surgical alteration. You must not use a memory doubler. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. God, that's such a great short story and such an awful movie. <laughs> <laughs> Methods could include RNA or intelligence or education implants, surgical alteration, military or mercenary training, and other systems. Alternatives must be allowed by the referee. Okay, so that was jammed in a little player character bit jammed in uh, amongst the uh, Starship stuff. Well, that's just bad organization. Why? Why couldn't it be better organized, like the Dungeon <laughs> Master's Guide? You know, that just is talking about government systems and then diverts into poisons. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so uh, trade and commerce, uh, like I was discussing before, um, mm -hmm. you, you pick up a random, uh, you pick up a random uh, cargo, and it'll be a certain price based on where you are. So uh, you know, agricultural products are cheaper on agricultural worlds, but you know, industrial products are more expensive, and so on. So, based logic on where it is, plus a bit of chance. Um, so that's when you do your spec cargoes. In practice, I find you make a little side income from that, but that's not going to pay your mortgage on your ship. To pay your mortgage on your ship, you've got to do some dodgy stuff, uh, you know, or just steal it. And players usually just steal it, so <laughs> unless they're granted one. Um, but even if they're granted one, they don't necessarily have it. Um, I, I was mean to the players in one campaign, the same campaign with the yacht, in fact. And uh, the merchant had done it. And I know the player merchant. And John, I love the guy. If, if you're watching, John, I love you, man. But I, <laughs> we, we know you cheat on your dice rolls all the fucking time. That's all right. I, I as Game Master, will just cheat back to balance things out. That's all right. Because um, <laughs> these characters are always really awesome. And they're less awesome if you're watching them closely when he rolls the dice. He's, the character is awesome. They get promoted fast and all the rest. Anyway. <laughs> And so he has a ship. And I said, okay, you own a ship. This does not mean that you have access to a ship. I mean, it's like when um, when you inherit a property. You know, like one case I knew, uh, there's a family. The old grandmother had died uh, mm -hmm. and she, she had the will and she bequeathed this and that to different family members and nobody disputed anything. There were no legal entanglements or whatever. And it was still more than 18 months before the stuff was officially in their ownership. It's still this legal process to go through. So there's that. And there's the fact that starships can travel between systems. So I said, yeah, you own a starship. But, you know, you're this retiring uh, merchant captain. Are they going to give you this shiny new one in the yard? No. <laughs> They'll give you this one that's in mothballs uh, in orbit around a gas giant 20 parsecs away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so... It's yours as soon as you go and get it. Here's go the activation it, codes. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the activation codes for it. So it lets you in. <laughs> um, and that was the whole campaign. Reaching Take that. care, fresheners. It smells like gym socks. <laughs> yep. It was it was 12 game sessions, and that was the whole campaign to to go to it. Spiffy. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, you even if they do roll up having a ship, if you don't want them to have one straight away, or you think it'd be more interesting if they don't have one. They don't have to have it straight away. You know, it could be because um, it's not. It doesn't say that. As I said, ownership does not mean it's physically present. It doesn't mean that it's intact or in good condition. It doesn't mean that there isn't somebody else who thinks that it belongs to him. Yeah. You know, if other ships can be stolen, maybe your ship was stolen. Yes, you do own it. Now you just have to go and get find that guy and serve him the papers and make him give it up. Go find but it. He has, yeah. a, but he has a shotgun. <laughs> so <laughs> if there's no weapon, other weapons, no turrets or whatever, you know, you've got to get through that airlock. 
<laughs> I, I I think a fun one would be is you get your ship, you know, it's on, it's not too difficult to get to. Like, you know, you're on the primary, it's on the moon, you fly up there, you're all happy and you're strolling up to your ship and there's a gaggle of people all arguing loudly. Maybe there's some pushing and shoving and, and they're like, oh, what are you doing here? Well, I'm here for my ship, your ship. And then you find <laughs> out that you are the primary shareholder of the ship <laughs> but all of these people are also shareholders of the ship yeah and you can buy them out or or you can do what they want to do with the ship until they're satisfied they've gotten their their shares out of it <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah, and then that's all the um, the trade goods that are available. Uh, purchase DMs is, um, so like, for example, textiles, A minus 7 means uh, agricultural. Yeah, A for agricultural world. So you roll a 2D6 and you apply a minus 7, you know, 40, it'll be 40% of the normal price. The normal price of textiles is 3,000, gotcha. but it'll be 40%. It, it, um, if you get that and then um resale r plus three so you want an r class world which is a rich world rich worlds they will pay extra for textiles so uh, r plus three when you go to resale it sell it on an average roll it's 100 percent obviously uh you get a plus three it becomes 10 130 percent so they'll pay 30 percent more than the base price so if you've bought it 40 percent the base price and you sell it 130 percent the base price that's pretty good but it's still only about a thousand dollars, a thousand credits, sorry, uh, per ton for textiles. It's not a really high value one. The high value ones, radioactives, <laughs> but they're not legal everywhere. Right. Computers are worth a lot, but there's not usually a lot available. And then there's there's other things too, and and of course you can have you can toss in your illicit things like narcotics and that, and some complete and, and some. Things that we think of as relatively harmless may be uh, illicit on the other one, on, on the other world. Uh, they may control it for uh, reasons of, not even reasons of uh, safety, like firearms and drugs are usually controlled, uh, but they might control it just because they've got tariffs on that. They've There's got this, uh, they got this nascent uh, agricultural industry and they want to um, protect it and make it grow. So they have massive tariffs. They might not just allow any um any imports of food at all and so on but that'll be more like the next book wealth and adventures there's a uh, a great bit of world building in one of the han solo books uh he's uh trying to get the falcon repaired uh because off screen before this book started he shot it out with a planetary government over uh what he was smuggling and what he was smuggling was fresh water <laughs> The government, it was a fascist totalitarian government who limited the amount of water, fresh water that people could have. And, yeah. uh, he, the uh, filler seal on the ship, uh, was, was leaking when he was entering the atmosphere. And a, a police ship <laughs> was like, Hey, that's clean water, heave too. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, contraband can be anything the game master says is contraband yeah yeah so there's lots of possibilities but as i said that that becomes a bit clearer once we get into the next book worlds and adventures worlds and adventures and that which, i think which that, we can do next week yeah that i was gonna say that one merits like a whole episode on its own so in the overall i mean traveler is very much now now like um uh earth kale is contraband <laughs> yeah it's toxic but uh no actually i kid a great recipe for kale is put a little bit of coconut oil in it in the pan and that way it slides right out of the pan into the garbage <laughs> um but uh you know a, a lot of genre role-playing games are very guilty of creating head in a jar players mech warrior for example mm. well the most important thing to me is my battle mech you know my 
father's father had it and I have it and I'll pass it on to my son and it's battle mech, battle mech, battle mech, battle mech. That's <laughs> it. That's all we're doing. This is to facilitate us having a fight in battle mechs. And so basically you're just like, look, why don't we just get together and play battle tech every Saturday? Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, and traveler completely avoids that problem. Traveler on its face might seem like a spaceship combat game, but as you say, it is pretty much the campaign end is the spaceship combat. Well, it's potentially ending. P you, potentially. You the campaign. Yeah, potentially. potentially. And it's a bit risky. Um, yeah. So um, what we'll see in in uh, book three, Worlds and Adventures, is uh, the, you can tune it up to be what you want. That's if something wasn't really, it's not really clear so far in characters in combat and uh, starships. Starships doesn't mention artificial gravity. The power plant, it doesn't say what the power plant is. Mm -hmm. Is it a chemical power? It's probably not chemical if it's using liquid hydrogen. Is it fission power? Is it fusion? Is it matter, antimatter? Is it you know, you chuck banana peels in, like in um, one of the Back to the Future movies. Yeah. <laughs> you just chuck a banana peel in a reactor. It doesn't say. It doesn't say. Um, so it's entirely up to the game master. Now, in the book three, you've got the technological levels chart. Um, mm -hmm. And so there you can see things like high, so like obviously laser rifles and things like that are higher tech level. Um, and then, you know, there's, there's different kinds of transport, including uh, starships, but different levels of drive and so on to that. So it would be quite possible to just have uh, jump drives and not have, you know, high tech maneuver drives and power plants and things like that. You, you know, you'd still need to store the liquid hydrogen for that. So you could get a little bit, um, I, I always forget what it's called, but, and I've never read it, but I've heard of it. There's some, uh, book series like like redneck space or something like that where basically it, it turns out that you you can make a warp drive or a jump drive with just stuff that you can get from radio shack nice. <laughs> and um and uh, you know a two-page <laughs> assembly list so there's guys that are like putting it together and take their rv into space with a lot of duct tape sealing the leaks out i love that <laughs> and they go out to explore the universe let me just, I, I know, I know you're not from, you, you know, you ain't from around here, Kyle, and most of the people uh, watching are not. Um, Brevard County is where uh, Kennedy Space Center is located. You know, it's humanity went to the moon. We have sent the most important probes to the outermost worlds, ships that will carry our legacy probably well past our extinction to into eternity have left from there brevard county is a backwards ass redneck county in florida <laughs> <laughs> it is and i say this with love and affection a hillbilly county. the idea <laughs> that that you could do that, that like you know it was discovered today that uh you know putting uh, two grains of thorium in a pound of common iodized salt will provide you with rocket fuel that will let you fly faster than light and a bunch of Brevard rednecks just setting their double wides up on their end and taking off into space. Well, it's such a lovely mental The, the trailer park guys, the trailers disappear. <laughs> yeah. Poof, and the, the air fills the vacuum where the trailer was. Uh, suddenly, suddenly, uh, cities in flight just got a lot less glamorous. Yeah. The, the old uh, uh, A.E. Van Vogt cities in flight book. And Elon Musk gets in his car and really does go this time. <laughs> yes, yeah, no car kidding. <laughs> so, you know, it's, um, there's that. You could do that if you want. You yeah. know, you could, you could say the jump drive is, okay, it's supposed to be 10 tons or whatever. Or, no, it's, I think it's only one ton, I can't remember. But it needs fuel, but whatever, you know. So somebody else goes with them and starts making liquid hydrogen fuel everywhere for them to take with them and selling liquid hydrogen tanks. 
<clears throat> so they can continue doing their jumps. <laughs> you get the, right on. the guy with, um, or you could just change uh, liquid hydrogen to propane. <laughs> <laughs> propane and propane accessories. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he goes into space and he's doing the refueling for them. You know? <laughs> space mogul Hank Hill. Damn it, yeah. Bobby. <laughs> get your vac suit on. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So um, you could do that if you want, or you can go all the way to solars because you could take the tech levels and, and nothing says that the technological levels have to be exactly the same for the different categories of gear that are presented on the charts. Um, so you can tune it up to be what you want. Uh, and so once again, uh, I, I say that, you know, my personal preference is for the, the earlier game systems like Classic Traveler and uh, AD&D and so on, because it is up to you, the game master and the players, what you do. They don't lay it all out for you with a, uh, a strict setting. This is how it's got to be, but you can play the sort of game that you want to. Yes. Yes. So Doom Sword is from kind of from my neck of the woods. He knows all about um he knows all about the space coast it sounds so sexy it sounds so high tech once you're off the reservation yeah nah, <laughs> nah. hey doom sword how about play linda beach play linda beach is uh again uh, for for the uninitiated is uh a it is a nude beach because the people that go there decided it would be a nude beach um and uh Unfortunately, as rockets have gotten bigger, the the safety ring around Kennedy Space Center has gotten bigger. So there has actually been uh, court clashes back in like the 80s um, between the naturists and NASA. Right. <laughs> Look, we have a fully fueled space shuttle sitting on the pad. You guys really need to not be there. <laughs> <laughs> you're just trying to interfere with our lifestyle. We're trying to stop you from being incinerated. <laughs> oh my gosh. But um, anyway, so nude beaches, shuttle explosions, rednecks in Brevard <laughs> County. These are the things that make traveler great. No, wait, no, that, that's not right at all. Um, <laughs> no, that's... Uh, uh that th that is um <laughs> Cooley says nude beach <laughs> practitioners shaking their fist at the skyrockets in flight oh <laughs> <laughs> oh we could we can finish with that because there was a uh, discussion on um on the traveler forum where the someone was talking about sonic boom they had they've shared a uh, a film of um, one of the SpaceX rockets coming back down and landing and, and uh, it had landed and, and yeah, you know, they were miles away and uh, some guy says, wait for it. And there's this boom of the sonic boom. And uh, I pointed out that any realistic uh, space drive, but realistic in the sense that follows science, not realistic in the sense we know how to make it or something. Right. Like for example, the expanse one, one guy went through and said, going on their description and calculating the physics, it turns out to have a power output of 98 terawatts. By uh, comparison, the, app, the power output of the entire human race at the moment is 18 terawatts. But, uh, <laughs> the 98 terawatts is equivalent to basically a 23 kiloton nuclear weapon going off every second. Yeah. So you don't do that taking off, right? So you, you take off by some other means, and then when you're 50 miles up or something, then you go and you hope that the EMP isn't bad. <laughs> then you kick in that drive. So I said, well, forget about the sonic boom. Don't look at it when it's taking off. The, yeah, no the kidding. air traffic control guys would be wearing welders goggles. <laughs> <laughs> Were you and I talking about Project Orion? Yeah. 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 So so for, for the uh, those who don't know, in the 60s, a project was proposed called Project Orion, whereby uh, pretty much a massive spaceship could be accelerated to like 0.9 C, just like an obscene speed. And the way that they projected they would do it is um, you'd have this massive spaceship. The back third of it would be full of nuclear bombs. The very ascent of the ship would be this 
like many, many, many dozens of meters or maybe hundreds of meters of diameter pusher plate. So the ship every two seconds would fart out a nuclear bomb that would go a programmed distance away from the ship out the middle of the shield and then blow up and the <laughs> pulse of heat and light and radiation would push the ship. And because it's, it's jettisoning these things like machine gun bullets, <laughs> it's going faster and faster, you know, it's accelerating faster and faster and faster and faster. Um, how do you get it off the ground? Cause I really don't think anybody's good. There yeah, was, listen, chain of nuclear was, explosions uh, right up there in the sky. There was a sci-fi, I think it was Larry Niven, called Footfall. Um, and an alien race that looks a bit like elephants comes to invade us. And so we make that spaceship as a battleship to go and, take, and fight them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it describes flying around in it. And it's like, boom, 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 boom. <laughs> <laughs> Shaking is like they get massive acceleration. Yeah, uh, and they end up defeating the aliens. You know. Nice, and, and and it's called footfall because the sign of submission is that they they lay down and let you put your foot on their head. <laughs> right, and it ends up with right. a human putting his foot on the alien's head. Love him or hate him, uh, I think it was Larry Niven. Yeah. Niven, it is Niven. Love him or hate him, if you want to inject your sci-fi with realism, check out Larry Niven's stuff. Even his fantastic stuff that does like okay that doesn't make any sense but it doesn't make sense in a way that makes sense if that makes sense um <laughs> like <laughs> ring world okay R ring world uh great example oh, okay. um the ring and ring world the amount of mass in the ring is about the equivalent to the amount of mass in our own solar system um but structurally, you know, you could not make you could not make a, a contiguous ring world. It would fall apart. You it would it would not be structurally sound enough. You could do it with little stations orbiting a sun, but um, comparatively little because the livable surface area in ring world is the equivalent of like six hundred billion Earths. It's it's an insane amount of space. Um, so Niven said, aha, well, this was built by aliens. Uh, uh, somebody's going to call me out on this, but I think it was the, the pack protectors. But um, they compressed the material to where it's only a, just like a few centimeters thick using technology. <laughs> and once you get past that, Everything makes sense. It's like once you get over that <laughs> hump, it's like, okay, I'm just going to accept that they invented scrith. That's the metal material that they made the ring out of scrith. Once I accept that scrith can be made, all the rest of the stuff makes perfect sense. And yes, that's that's entirely doable. Mm. Um, but uh, anyway, so time to finish up. Time to wrap up. <laughs> Closing thoughts on ships and and so on. I uh, now. Until tonight, I was this I was this many years old before I, I knew that ship to ship combat in Traveler is can be can be the end game. Um we didn't get our hands really dirty with the actualities of combat. I want to come back and do that someday. Mm -hmm. Um with the understanding again that it's the end of the game as we know it for the unlucky uh, recipients of a particle beam weapon. Um, <laughs> the ownership of ships is an interesting aspect that I like. And the birthing, not, you know, having babies, but the, you know, the, the where, how you travel, when you travel in Traveler. Mm -hmm. Very fascinating aspects of the game. Also drugs. <laughs> it was just slipped in there. Just, just slide that in. Mark Miller's like, drugs well after you wrote the first book the players were probably asking them about it and, and pulling yeah. all the stuff out of for fiction he's like okay like what about oh, space well, drugs there man <laughs> there wasn't enough in the first book anyway enough space so we'll, we'll just slot it in there randomly right on <laughs> right on so um good stuff uh and our next book we're gonna do planet building now yeah. i know we we gotta wrap up 
uh, I, we have another stream coming up. Uh, well, I have another stream. You're going to go do normal human things. I have another <laughs> stream coming up in uh, in 90 minutes with another guest. But uh, just a little teaser. Is planet building going to be as fun as hex building in AD&D? &D? It's exactly the same. <laughs> Woohoo! And I mean that unironically. I am, I am pumped about that. <laughs> I enjoy that. Except it's random worlds instead of random uh, monsters. Cool. Uh, and instead of monsters, you have patron, patrons and law enforcement and stuff. So next week, we're going to get into, uh, we're going to make some planets. You guys have had it too easy watching us make hexes. We're going to make <laughs> planets. Um, well, that is all very awesome stuff. Uh, we absolutely appreciate everyone. Great comments tonight. Lot, lots of lots of good chatter in the chat. Um Normal human things and not lizard people things. See, Lord Corian brings it all the way back to the beginning because we started the stream talking about the lizard people. Yes, and Lord Corian, you, you never forget, there was Diana from V who was a lizard person. And then Princess Diana, who supposedly was killed because she found out about the lizard people in the royal family. But was V really predicting that Diana herself was a lizard person by exactly. name, that character Diana. Perhaps she was going to go fifth column on the rest of the lizard people and warn us and be a good lizard person. And that's why they offed her. We're through the looking oh, glass. Oh, yes, people. good lizard person like Freddy Krueger was in the in the series. I can't remember the actor's name. It's all was a... coming again. It's all making sense now. Yeah, the one who played the barman, that actor yeah. who played the barman and Yes. Went on to be Freddy Krueger. Uh, uh, Robert England is that actor's uh, yeah, name. That's right. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, thanks to the following lizard people for supporting us uh, on Patreon. Uh, lizard Patreon, that is. Uh, Digital Discord, Joshua Garlock, Lord Corian, Ricky Maru, Mobius, Kevin Reynolds, Joseph Lucas, Doomsword Deathmaster, Mark Simpson, Damien X247, James F. Keck, William Smith, and the Dungeon Minister. And of course, Manny Wall, we really, really thank you guys supporting numbers the show. Numbers are creeping up. The Patreon numbers are creeping up. Uh, a little bit, a little bit. But as I always say, you guys subscribing and clicking the bell icon for notifications and telling your friends to subscribe and click the bell icon and liking the videos and engaging us in the chats, that's awesome too. We love you just the same. If you want to support us on Patreon, that's great. If you want to just watch the channel and chill out, that's awesome too. Rich or that's, famous, we'll take one. Rich or famous, we'll take one. If we get both, <laughs> that's even better. That's even better. Um, so you guys have an absolutely fantastic uh, evening. Please do come back for the 10 o'clock show. I will be here with my buddy, uh, Michael Sokolov, talking about his podcast, gaming as a dad and all sorts of fun things so i'll be back in 90 minutes kyle will be back next week and if this if you got stuff to do you gotta eat dinner you gotta go walk the dog gotta go to spinning class i don't know what spinning class is but if you got to do it it's catch um, the show where later. they make where they make thread out of the, the wool all right thank you and we'll be back to well i'll be back tomorrow kyle you can come back if you want to but i'll be back tomorrow so have a great evening, everyone. You're lovely, and we'll see you later. We are out of here.